How's it going and welcome to episode 46 of On The Wire, proud member of the Pitcher List Podcast Network. Follow the pod on the Twitter at On The Wire Pod. Of course, if you're listening on a platform that allows ratings and reviews, please take a second to let us know what you think. I am Adam Howe. You can follow me on the Twitter at 80 grade. That's all spelled out. And I am once again joined by Kevin Hastings, who should be followed on the Twitter himself at Hastings Kevin. Kevin, we talked about it last week that we were awaiting the announcements of TG FBI League. They went out and we were recording this on Monday. So almost a full week before we actually publish it. What are your thoughts on the your league placement? No, oh, it's it's great as always. It's just a fantastic event to be a part of. And, and I'm thankful to Justin Mason for putting it together and for allowing all of us to take part. And yeah, it's it's funny. I, I watched part of the live stream <laughs> of was, Justin and great. Danielle <laughs> doing the, the nominees. It, it, it was really cool. It's just a great event. I can't remember. I think it's League 16, I'm in League 24, but I think it's League 16 that it looked like, oh, I'm glad I'm not in that one. <laughs> And they brought it up, and I think Justin said it during the, the announcements. Ooh, that's the one people are going to call the League of Death, and I was just nodding as he said <laughs> it. Yeah. yeah, I think I was talking to Miles Nelson, our Miles Nelson of Pitcher List, about his league. I think it's League 3. But it's uh, the top two, as he starts listing off the names, it's just the top two alone. It was Vlad Sedler and, and Tanner Bell. I'm, oh, oh yeah, in the same league. Good yeah. luck, Miles. You get the <laughs> reigning champion and then obviously the gut. Like, good luck with that. He's looking forward to that. I got my wish that I talked about last week. It was, I'm 99% sure I don't. I have not drafted with anybody in my league. That's League 6. Shout out to League 6. So I'm really looking forward to that aspect of it. I don't. I actually don't think I've drafted with any of them last year either. That was my goal. I didn't tell Justin about it and pretty happy to get get my wish upon a star, if you will. So I'm also very much looking forward to it, um, hoping to build on, I think I was like 121 last year, but I was in the top 55 the year before. So I'm hoping to get back at least down there in the over. But enough talking about where we're going to be. We have uh, a lot of uh, great stuff to talk about for this episode. And joining us this week, we have a very special guest, Matt Williams. Matt should be followed on the Twitter himself at Matt at Matt Williams with the L's replaced with sevens and can be heard regularly hosting the turn Two podcast. Uh, Matt also contributes regularly to NBC Sports Edge, The Athletic, and of course, Roto Fanatic, in which he is the founder and co-owner. Oh, and Matt's trophy case sports uh, tout wars championship as well. So not too shabby there. We're going to spend some time getting Matt's takes on who could take advantage of certain situations around the league once moves can be made and the lockout is over and players can be traded for, signed, etc. And I think we're going to get a whole lot of news all at once, just like we did at the beginning of uh, right before the lockout started. But first, Matt, thanks so much for coming on the show, man. How you doing? Hey, I'm doing pretty good. Yeah, TGFBI, you have all sorts of leagues going. I've been drafting since October. I don't care if there's a lockout. It's going <laughs> to end eventually. And when it does, I'm probably going to hate all my teams. Like you said, there's going to be a flurry <laughs> of activity over two days with, I, God, I'm going to be, it's going to be exciting with the, the lockout finally ends with, depending on, you know, who, there's going to be so many trades. I know no one's allowed to be talking, but they have to be talking. though, right? You know they're talking. Yeah. They're talking. They um, have to be. They got yeah, cell so, numbers. Yeah. yeah so they got backdoor I mean, channels. Yeah. Yeah. And plus there's all these random rumors coming out. Are they being fabricated? Um, like who's like they're saying, oh, this team is supposed to be pursuing so and so. I'm like, real Jesus making this up or people are talking. Oh, they are. But it sorry. happened before the lockout. They keep saying talks yeah. before the lockout. No, yeah. they weren't. That was it's been <laughs> it's a waited month, two it's months been to tell two us months about, about it. it. Yeah. yeah. Or you get like the Justin Verlander deal that wasn't quote finalized until a month after the lockout stopped. Yeah. So stuff's happening. We all are well aware, or we like to think that we're well aware at least. All right. Well, awesome. Yeah. I am also looking forward to going back and looking at my October slash November draft, like my very first draft. That'll be the most exciting thing I do in March is go back and look at that draft in that team and be like, why? Like, why did I make those decisions or think? I'm so glad I made that decision. That's a conversation that I think uh, is worth having. I've only um, been doing draft and hold, so I don't have to have that crazy fa first fab period where everyone's sure. bidding. Like, I don't need that noise. So, yeah, I, uh, whatever the damage is done, either I did well or I didn't. 
You got to so, live with it. <laughs> yeah. Everyone played by the same rules and yeah, it's fine. I'm fine with it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's the fire meme. Yeah, it's fine. This is all fine. <laughs> All right. We're going to get into our first segment. Uh, We like to call moving targets. These are players that we're keeping an eye on. If you are doing Fab Leagues now, if you were to start, if you were in the last five rounds of an actual Fab League, whether it be 12 team, 15 team, whatever that may be, these are players that you might be targeting in those last five rounds. And as I think I'll get into a little bit, a lot of times these kind of players, you might look up ADP and they might have an ADP of like in the 450s. But in a fab league, they're gonna jump. They're they're gonna be jumping up. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get right into it with my first pick here, a guy that I have targeted at least in one of my two fabs that I've drafted is uh, Jeremy Pena, possible starting shortstop for the Houston Astros. And we talked about him just in briefly with uh, Jeff Zimmerman a couple of weeks ago as we went through a couple of his mining the news. And since that episode, he put out another note on him in a most recent, more recent mining the news back in about three weeks ago, two and a half half weeks ago on the 19th about just more and more speculation that Pena could at very least be competing for the starting shortstop gig in Houston with Correa obviously being out the door with him selling off all of his memorabilia and what have you so it's very it's pretty even though he hasn't signed and the door is technically open I don't think anybody here is assuming he's going to go back to Houston I think the biggest assumption everybody's making is that they're going to go out and sign somebody else. Like they're going to get another bigger name like Trevor Story or or fill that hole. And the other guessing game you have is will Alex Bregman move back to shortstop? And the Astros have said that they're not going to do that. But Bregman himself has said, I'm open to it. Like I'll do it if I need to. But I think the most obvious play here is Jeremy, Jeremy Pena comes up from triple A whether he starts opening day because he has a really strong spring training is up in the air, but he's 24 years old. He shouldn't, he's at a point in his prospect age range that there's not really much else to hold him back as far as holding, getting that extra time. And this is a guy that at the end of drafts, if it hits, especially if you're drafting a fab league right now, he can be that middle infielder from day one that can get you that extra 10, maybe 15, maybe more stolen bases without hurting anything else. Like he, I think his, all his projections have him at about 240, 250 batting average with a 300 BABIP. Um, he's had a high BABIP throughout the course of the minors. How much you want to weigh BABIP at the minor leagues is questionable, if anything else. But he's always had, he's always had a strong hit tool throughout. His strikeout rate has been climbing throughout the minors. He, he finished with a 26% strikeout rate in AAA last year. But only that's only with 122 at bats, 133 plate appearances. I don't mind that he has a really high ground ball rate. He's a fast guy. He can beat those out. I actually prefer that personally. It allows him to get him on base. But Zips has him down for 117, a couple of different uh, steamer 117 games throughout the course of the season. Double digit stolen base, double digit home runs. I think this is a this is a kind of good flyer to take exactly without knowing anything else. And I think he's going to raise up um, draft boards as March and spring training goes on. As you get more clarity, you can still get him in a you know post 300 range. As I noticed, as I alluded to earlier, his draft champions ADP over the course of the last two weeks or three weeks is been 440. But in the online championships, the 12 team fab leagues that have been happening on NFBC in that same time frame, his ADP is 309. So the, there are already players in Fab Leagues that are taking are jumping him up because of that possible uptick in production that they could see. And like we say with all these picks, there's a fir- there's a fab period before the season starts. If he doesn't win that job or he doesn't look good in spring training or they sign somebody, he doesn't have a clear path. He's an easy cut and you can fill that gap somewhere else through fab. Do you guys have any, either one of you guys have any insight um, or thoughts on Jeremy Pena? Have Matt, of all the drafts that you've been doing since October, even the draft and holds, have you targeted him in any of those? No, not in draft and hold, only because there, I, I there you have to. There's no, there's no for everyone doesn't hasn't played in draft and hold. There's no um, free agency. There's no waiver. So if he doesn't get the job for some reason, God forbid, they actually do bring back Correa or Story. He's not seeing the field probably that much. They could bring him up in the event of an injury and move around the infield, but it's maybe not my favorite idea there. But yeah, in a fab league, like you said, like Adam said, the, if he doesn't get the job, you can cut him. If things doesn't work out, you can cut him. 
So yeah, I love, these are the exact kind of picks I like to make at the end of a fab draft, even like a similar thing. People really like Bryson Stott over the Phillies, similar situation. I don't like that maybe as much. He's if you're digging at the very end, because I think there's more of a chance he does start in the minors. There's one thing that Pena has that it, he's just a supremely fantastic defensive player. So the Astros would have more of a reason to put him out there because you know he's going to add value uh, no matter what, even if he struggles a little bit offensively, but he should still be strong. So yeah, I like Pena quite a bit uh, in fab and, and draft and hold not as much, but it's all about balancing those kind of things. So I'd take him there, but uh, yeah, I guess uh, I just haven't so far, but yeah, it's definitely a good uh, pick for fab. Well, the other thing I'll add there is it's the fact that shortstop, everybody talks about how deep shortstop is. And I think we've mentioned this on previous episodes as well, but I'll, I'll echo it a little bit more. It is deep. There's a lot of really good shortstops available in drafts. But that's they the problem. They're all really good and they <laughs> all get drafted and they all get rostered. So especially in a 15 team fab league, there's not going to be a lot of quality replacement level players on the wire to fill in a shortstop stop. So to have somebody who could have everyday playing time in my middle infield who is shortstop, if my shortstop, my starting shortstop is my only other shortstop on the on my roster, it's nice to have that backup. We're not having to go fumbling, trying to find somebody who's lucked in since some time or is playing every other day or happens to have shortstop eligibility, but really isn't producing. So somebody that's something that I'll be targeting for my middle infield position alone, never mind as like one of my reserve picks. Yeah. Um, in, a, in a fab league at the very end, you're like, oh, I missed on shortstop. Don't take in Drelton Simmons, hoping that he signs with the Yankees and he has a mediocre half a season at the, in the nine hole <laughs> and take a shot on, in fab leagues. Yeah. Take a shot right. on a, take a shot on pain. It's a much better payoff. I've gotten Simmons and draft and holds at like pick 600 and something. I've also stretched yeah. out and picked them out at four fifty. So it's, he goes everywhere or he has been going everywhere. And draft and hold, you do weird stuff. It just, it's the way the draft goes. Sometimes you just need to fill in one of I, uh, Max Muncy's permanently on my do not draft list. I have one share because I totally missed the boat on corner infield. And it was at a point where, all right, there's a glob of people I could take here. Muncy's still on the board. The entire league's ignoring him, including me. So I just take him. So yeah, I, so it, you make nice. picks. Sometimes and, you and make there's picks. There's a chance they put him at first with. base so he doesn't have to throw. Yeah. <laughs> hey, if he in that league, because of the way I built everything else, that's obviously my weakest spot. He's still a backup. Yeah. If he hits, I'm gold. <laughs> but right. yeah, it's, it, it all depends on the draft. You got to be. That's one thing. They everyone puts out their do not draft list now, which I do have players I avoid that I'm not going to take, and I probably won't have many shares of uh, Max Muncy. That was just a prime, like uh, extreme example. But yeah, you got to be able to adjust. Don't say no to anything. Sometimes you just gotta. You gotta take a. Sometimes you gotta take it in Jolton Simmons. <laughs> it's yeah. the way it goes. Not in, you don't have don't to feel good about it. Part. Yeah, you don't have to feel good about it. Just. Do it with your eyes closed. <laughs> yeah, do it All with right. your eyes closed. Maybe you'll pick another player instead. It'll work out better. <laughs> oh, may, that made that wrong mouse click. Oh, maybe it'll be the right mouse click. All right, Kevin, who who's your moving target for this week? Kind of like with Garrett Cooper last week. I'm going with a guy that this is completely based on health, and that's Mike Moustakis of the Reds, and especially if – they would just put him in that DH role, assuming we're going to have DH in the National League to keep him healthy. He's been banged up for a couple of years, and we all know that. But 38 home runs, 35 home runs, his last couple of full seasons, you can't go wrong here. He's like at pick 374. So if you're at the end of a 12-team fab league, this is the kind of guy, once again, like Matt was saying, in a draft and hold, when I'm looking to – shore up at bats and yeah he's not an ideal guy there's too many question marks about playing time there due to injury but in a fab league if he's healthy through spring training the last weekend before the season starts in march he's going much higher than this so grab him now in that spot if he's not healthy you drop it yeah, I think he fits into the same mold I was talking about with Pena, but with obviously with third base instead of shortstop. It's if you have that hole at that at the hot corner, he's only that's the only thing. Like Musagas, I'm so used to him being available at three different positions for at least a couple of years, whether it's first, second, third base. And when he first came up, he was a shortstop. And, and it's really odd to look at him right now. I'm just looking at the ADP board and 
just going down the positions and he only has that one singular position available. That's not to say that he couldn't walk him back, you know, back himself into being a utility role maybe again, but I don't think it's likely. I think it's more likely to your point that he ends up spending more time at DH than anything else. With yeah. If NHL gets the DH, that might be his only eligible position next season. Next season. And he's just, he's also a classic guy that's like, he played injured most of the year, the year prior or didn't play at all because of injury. And you wonder it, how much of that played into the lack of production that he actually had last year. And there'll be a lot of people that it's a, it's good to take shots on people that are third base eligible in general at the yeah. very end, just because I don't, I don't think it's a cesspool. Like a lot of people do. It's obviously top heavy in, in terms of safety, but there's like a ton of late players that Flyers. like Chapman and Suarez and, and Moustakis and, and Moncada. And there's a lot of players that could do really well. It's just, there's question marks after the first four, even like Rendon and Bregman, the, the safety lops off after Chris Bryant, who, you know, hey, God. you'll have people like Santiago Espinal. If the Blue Jays do not acquire another third baseman, I expect his ADP to shoot up. He'd probably be, he's not my guy, but he'd probably be a guy worth taking a shot on. In nine hole or not, if you're in the nine hole for the Blue Jays, you'll get enough at bats to make that worth. He's got a little speed, a little yeah, pop. That, that whole idea of that second leadoff hitter, if you will, at the, in the yeah. nine hole, especially in the American League where they already have the DH. And third base might not be as much of a cesspool as some think, Matt, but I will say, especially in draft, but going back to draft and holds, corner infield is, it dries up extremely fast in draft and holds. So I've ever told you about the time I drafted Max Muncy. <laughs> <laughs> it rings a bell. Yeah, yeah. I think I heard that one. <laughs> All right, well, Matt, who who are you looking at then at the end of your uh, Fab League drafts? Tyrone Taylor. I love this guy. I've, it's funny, the enthusiastic Brewers fans turned me on to looking closer to him last <laughs> season. He is someone where you look at projections, you look at their lineup, and that you may not totally understand, especially before the roster resource type pages put in the DH. People were just overlooking him, but he's this guy that has a decent track record of being like a average hitter in the minors, but he has pop, he has speed, which is ever, what everyone wants. And he's going incredibly late. The thing is, some people don't see the at-bats, but the thing is one, DH, that'll be there. And Christian Yelich is on the team. And so is blanking on him right now. The, oh, no, well, not Hunter Ruff, oh, the Lorenzo Kane. So yeah, he's an everyday player. Between DH, <laughs> between Yelich, between a Kane, he's going to play every day. And he has over a 90% in zone contact rate that you love to see that put the ball in play. If you have, uh, he has incredible sprint speed. He has like the high BABIP skills. He gets a little more fly balls than line drives, but that is something that in the past he's been a little more, he has a track record of being a little better, but if he can just hit a little better, um, his, his batting average could maybe take a bump off. He's going to hit all these fly balls. Then in, it's he's, he's in a nice park and a nice lineup to probably crank up a bunch of home runs. You might have to live with a lower average, but there is room for a much higher average for him to actually take off. If he can just adjust his like standard deviation launch angle, we talk about the back control. Uh, if he's going to be in there every day, Tyler O'Neill said he turned around last year because he's in there every day. You have the ability to actually make adjustments. So he's going to have a whole off season to work knowing how they're going to use him. It's getting extra room now, but yeah, he'll be in there every day, and he is someone that I think has a possibility. Everyone talks about this year, Cedric Mullins. It's nobody, but I, I think that if he plays every day, he certainly has the ability to give you like, I don't know, he could give you like a 250 batting average, but maybe 20, 25 home runs, maybe uh, 15, 20 stolen bases if they let him loose. I would count more on towards 10, but yeah, he's uh, he's someone that is just that. If he gives you 250, 20, and 10, Fantastic. I'll there take, you go. It's like a really cheap Andrew Benintendi, like at the end of the draft. Uh, so yeah, I like him. Yeah, he has, well, y- you will be able to get him because at least in the last six OCs, he has not been drafted. At least he's not showing up on an ADP board. And so I think that he'll be much more popular in a 15, like in a main event, in a 15 team fab league later on. I-, I can see us, Kevin, recommending Taylor as like one of the first couple weeks worth of fab, especially if he does prove himself, like if the Brewers, Matt, like you said, if he shows that he can get everyday playing time and we see that in the first week and a half, two weeks, he'll be somebody that we're eyeing to, to jump on in fab in 12 teamers. I don't think you're going to be able to fab him in a 15 teamer though. To Matt, to your point, look at um, look at this, this projection. This is ATC batting average, 241, 17 home runs, 16 stolen bases, 74 runs, and 57 RBIs. 
is that an acceptable player? Because that's Robbie Grossman, what they have for him. People are paying up for Robbie Grossman. I think that Tyrone Taylor can overall match or possibly exceed that. So it's just one of those things. I love my draft strategy. I always say is death by a thousand paper cuts. I love drafting those guys <laughs> that give you just a little bit of everything. I never take zeros in power or a zero in home runs. Even if someone's giving you like four or five stolen bases, they add up. But yeah, adding guys like this are bread and butter. So yeah. Yep. Good and keep and it on. doesn't even take an injury because they're going to be resting Christian Yelich. They're going to be resting yeah. Lorenzo Cain. He's going to get his playing time probably out of the gate. Yep. Yeah, Robbie Grossman going at, and those OCs at pick 191 on average. So to your point, yeah, they, if you're going to pay up for somebody like Robbie Grossman, it's that old, it's that Twitter thing that's going around all everywhere right now. If you, <laughs> why pay 191 for Robbie Grossman <laughs> when you can pay round 32, it doesn't exist, <laughs> for Tyrone Taylor? It's funny, I've been saying it all offseason, but I, I word it differently. I always say Freed is a cheaper version of Alcantara, but I say I'm not trying to talk you out of taking Sandy. Just if you like Sandy, you should love Freed. Take Grossman, <laughs> take Taylor, <laughs> wait on outfield, take them both. I'm not trying to talk you off of someone else. I'm just trying to say that this other guy is uh, definitely uh, someone you might probably want to bump up. Worth your time. Yeah. Worth your time. All right. Now it's time to talk about those situations we alluded to earlier uh, around baseball that have the potential to look very different before the start of the season based on rumors and speculation. You may have heard this off season, even during the lockout. But before we do that, we're going to take this quick break. Hey, Alex Fast here, and thanks for listening to this podcast on the Pitcher List Podcast Network. If you're a fan, consider supporting all of us by getting a PL Plus subscription, where you're going to get an ad-free website and get access to our Discord, where you can talk to all of our podcast hosts and staff. Plus, you can hang out with our incredible Pitcher List community. It's basically a baseball sanctuary year-round for as low as $8 a month. You can sign up at pitcherlist.com backslash plus, and you're going to get your first month free with promo code podcast. Also, don't forget to check out everything else we do as well from YouTube videos, live streams, newsletters, off-season articles, TikToks, breakdowns, over 15 baseball podcasts on our network. We can't stop talking about baseball even during the off-season. So sign up for PL Plus today at pitcherlist.com backslash plus and use promo code podcast to get your first month free. All right. Thanks for listening. Let's get back to the show. All right, and we are back. We are going to talk a little bit about some of those situations that I alluded to, what could happen, play some hypotheticals. But Matt, we talked about all the draft and holds that you've been drafting. How many leagues have you drafted so far since October? Probably like 15. Okay. And they all, you said that they're all draft and holds. Are they DCs? Are they 50s? Or are they a mix? They're all the 150s. All 150 draft champions. Okay, they're all draft champions, sure. So they're all 15 teamers. So deep, the deepest pool that you know we can find on a regular basis. We're talking a little bit about the guesses that we can make throughout these drafts, especially rounds 31 through 50 after a typical Fab League, at least on NFBC, would end. So I, I guess when you are in that range. W- what kind of guesses are you making? You alluded to the difference between playing time and what have you, but are you making somewhat educated guesses, but guesses nonetheless on playing time versus skills, or what are you focusing on the most when you're making those uh, those late round? I like la- bats are hard are really hard to predict. There's some instances like the Jorge Mateo. They haven't projected for the bench. He's more talented than everyone in front of him. All he has to do is beat out like Rough Neto Door and Ramon Urias, and, and he's in there. He's someone you can make an educated guess on, okay, he could easily do this, especially with a left field wall moved back like 900 feet. He could rack up more triples, maybe more batting average. So that's an educated guess. More often than not, it's if you strike out on those late picks and you're not right, then you really put yourself in a hole because even though you're dra- you know, 700 players are being drafted, those you're going to end up needing everyone because of injuries. So I like to fill my at-bats early in the draft. Uh, I like to draft uh, my offense much, much earlier. Not to say I'm ignoring pitching by any means, but I'll, I'll be pretty balanced for the first third. Middle third, I'm hammering, hitting. And at the end, I'm going to pitch. That will be like most of my picks. When other people are trying to take shots on just like the worst pitchers in the world, like the Jake Arrieta's of the world, not these around anymore, but when people are filling up on these randos, I love to take uh, some middle relievers. If I'm going to throw someone, especially the way 
bullpens are used now. Why, when you're going after all these other people, I'm gonna, I'm taking Chad Green, even Clay Holmes on the Yankees. I'm taking some strikeout relievers who I know that can lower my ratios, maybe luck into some wins, stuff like that. But I'm saying there's also late round flyers you want in pitching. You don't necessarily want to give them all away on a podcast if you're doing as many drafts as I'm on. But yeah, you don't want to load up on starting pitching for your, if you're taking eight pitchers in your draft, you don't want them to be eight random pitchers and four of them are going to be like unusable. So yeah, I, I like to, yeah, I, I like to take my guesses for a few starting pitching and I like to take relievers late too. But yeah, as far as hitting, that's a dangerous game. I do not like to play. That's why fab leagues take all your shots. If you're wrong, you can fix it. And draft and hold, I don't like to gamble too much. As far as, like you said, educated guests, I think we'll get to this in a little bit. Like Jeff McNeil, if he doesn't get traded, he'll play. I, I, I J.D. Davis is probably getting traded. I think he'll play. You, you could be wrong there, but there's enough reason to think that, all right, look at the plan. Look what's going to happen. This guy's probably going to, I mean, McNeil gets traded. He plays every day. If J.D. Davis gets traded, he plays every day. If either one of them are traded to the Mets, one of them probably plays more. So it's just, yeah, you can take shots like that. But as far as just like hoping and praying, I don't like to do it too much. <laughs> that's, that's probably fair. Hey, Kevin, I reminded of something I heard Rob Silver say in the Longego podcast. This was weeks, months ago at this point. But he, I'm going to paraphrase, obviously. But he said along the lines of like, he's more worried about players, especially later on, that need to make multiple changes, whether they need to make, they have to move up in a skill set, they have to also get healthy, and they also have to find playing time. Which of those three things, like if of a player that you're taking a guess on later on only has to do two of those things, what's the third thing on there that you're least or you're most concerned about? And of those three, which ones are you the least concerned about? I think we're most concerned about playing time, but I think that's the one Ron Chandler has said for years that that takes care of itself, draft skills. And I, I don't know that's what we're necessarily looking at this point in drafts when we're 600 to 750 players deep in a draft, but it is the reason at this point in a draft and hold, and Matt was very clearly making the case that when he was bringing up Andrelton Simmons, he was saying in a fab league in a draft and hold, I'm drafting Andrelton Simmons, no matter where he signs, he's playing unless he goes to keep his defense is keeping him on the field. So it's the biggest concern, but I think it's one of the things we can speculate on the, the easiest, like the guys that play good defense, the guys that if they're healthy, they're going to play. So in a roundabout way, the answer to your question would be it's the, when we're talking draft and holds, when we're talking this late in drafts, It's young guys and prospects are the ones I'm steering away from. We just don't know, especially with not having a CBA right now. We just have no idea when and if they're going to get an opportunity. Defense and guys that have been bothered by injuries in the past but are healthy right now, those are two things that are big pluses for me at that stage in drafts. Yeah, so what I'm hearing is that, again, of those three, the playing time aspect of it, in most cases, whether it be hitters or pitchers, really, or at least a road, a path to possible playing time is the most important of those three things. So if if a player is still coming back from injury or you feel comfortable that he's going to come back from injury and he's also making improvements in, in his game, if he doesn't have that playing time, it, it matters way less, even if he has the other two of those three things. And so... That kind of segues into the, in this next question about playing time. Oh, real quick, w- can, I, can I have something before we move on? Yeah, of course. No, so it's just the um, one thing that I think I see a lot of people do, uh, especially when chasing rookies, which which Kevin was bringing up, is you're bringing up players and you're looking for, a lot of people are looking for skills and then we're looking for playing time. And then some will say, all right, if this guy hits well enough, they'll have no choice but to put him in the lineup. Wrong. They do have a choice. They just <laughs> won't do it. Do not draft people that require an injury in order for something to work out. Do not do, people do it all the time. Like, where is he going to play? It'll work out. It may not work out. If there's injury prone people, I know people hate injury prone, but there's obviously people that are injury prone. We talked about the Brewers. If that, look for a realistic way for the player to get in. Like you could literally see them by the end of April getting into the lineup. Look for that. Don't, 
if if it looks if there's too many roadblocks in the way, if you require a trade, if you require an injury, then you know you try to steer away. Try to limit the variables. Do yourself do yourself. Matt, I appreciate that because that makes a way clearer segue into what I was going to ask here. So I will lead it into you. How much stock should we be putting into those trade rumors that some of them we're going to talk to about a little bit later, especially prior to spring training? when you're deciding to draft these players under certain assumptions. And I'm pointing specifically to, and we talked about this last week, Craig Kimbrell's quote, guaranteed trade to a team that needs a closer and that he's guaranteed to be moved to a team that needs a closer and becomes that closer. How much stock are you putting into that? It sounds like not much, but talk a little bit about your assumptions there. That's a unique one because I am... I'm with the rest of the group. I think I think it's close to guarantees getting traded. There were two reasons. They picked... He sucked as a setup man. He's terrible. <laughs> He's so they, why would they want him back in that role? And there's plenty of people that are going to want a closer. And I, I think someone's going to bite on him. He was very good as a closer. He's so, he's being traded. It's actually why I'm not as, as psyched about like getting in on like the Corey Knables of the world, who I think could be really good. But given how he hasn't pitched a full season and the Phillies could be a team that could easily get in Kimbrel, it just scares me. But I, yeah, I, I think... I'm okay drafting Kimbrel, especially the way relief pitchers have been moving, have been actually being really pushed up early in draft season. Uh, that'll shake out more as more drafts are filled in, but the top guys will be probably still going to the top. But after Kimbrel gets a job, boom, he's to the top even further up. Kenley Jansen, he'll jump up another round or two as soon as he signed. But I think no matter what, I'd be Jansen, no matter what's a closer. Kimbrel, I'm pretty sure gets gets signed. So and here's my hypocrite answer. Matt's hypocrite answer. I have zero shares of Kimbrel. I'm probably not going to have any, but I think he's a very good deal right now because I think he's going to get traded. As far as any other rumors, yeah, you can't really act on them early. Late, I mentioned Jeff McNeil. Well, you're going to ask me about this. I know you are, but just to go back to it, and I'm speaking my experience as a Mets fan, you can look into things that are likely to happen. The Mets have a log jam. Someone's getting traded. For as late as J.D. Davis is going, take a shot. It could blow up in your face. He could just be in a platoon with Dom at DH, which would probably be a really awesome, Dominic Smith, a really awesome platoon at DH. But more often than not, there have been rumors that McNeil's going to be traded. Even if he's not, he's being drafted late enough where it doesn't blow up in your face. But if he does, big boost in value. So, yeah, I would only look into trade rumors and maybe not necessarily the people that are headlining the trade rumors, maybe the secondary people like, Who's being drafted late that would see like a giant shoot shot in value if something were to happen? But overall, you got to ignore trade rumors in uh, when it comes to the top like 150 picks, 200 picks for the most part. But uh, yeah, with Craig Kimbrell, I again, I will go back to the very beginning and I could have probably ended at this and said nothing else. He sucked as a setup man. And there's no way the White Sox are going to let that happen again. They got Kendall Graveman for a reason. It's to bid Craig Kimbrell farewell. Yeah, Kimbrell in those OCs, ADP of 135. So the very at the 11 12 turn. And the thing I see, Kimbrell, is you said that it's a really good value where he's going right now. I think that there's like an equal amount of people baking in the fact that he's going to be a closer and people like just pushing him down just a little bit. I think to get that really good value that you alluded to, he'd be having to go at least two, just two or three rounds a little bit later. I think he's being drafted. Yes, he's going to go up. You're absolutely right. If he once he does get traded into a role that he's obviously the closer, he'll jump up to at least where the Edwin Diaz is and in the fifth, sixth round. And this is in a 12 teamers. And so, I, I, yeah, maybe that is like a five or six round discount, if you will, right now. But as I said last week, like I, I'd rather just pay the fifth round pick when I know for sure where he's going to be than... Tenth round is it's not like free. It's not like everybody's like. I already told you I was. It was a hypocrite answer. I have zero shares. I plan on having zero shares. I'm just telling everyone what the facts are. I'm still not doing it. I'll go. Yeah, I'm willing to pay. I'm willing to shop down the expensive aisle. Kevin, what about what about players that are like even higher end? And, and we're going to talk about one of them a little bit later. In a different context, though. So I'm bringing him up now, like Matt Olson. All the Yankees fans say he's going to New York and obviously he would be great in that ballpark and in that lineup, et cetera, et cetera. But like, how much do these assumed trade scenarios going to influence you at the top of your draft rather than in the mid or later rounds? Zero. Zero. Okay. We have no idea. We go through this every year and we're wrong. I'm on 95% of where these guys are going. So 
a guy like Matt Olson, if he can hit the way he hit last season in Oakland, then yeah, he can hit pretty much anywhere. Am I going to give him the bump of, Ooh, if he's in Yankee stadium? No, but he's probably a, a, a decent pick where he's at. I don't think I've drafted him. Maybe I did once or twice real early back in October, November. I, I, where he goes doesn't mean a whole lot to me at other players. It makes a bigger difference. And I, I, I really try. And this is just the last couple of years. I've really gotten in the mode of trying to stay out of all of the, we're speculating enough when we play this game, that's all we're doing. We're speculating on what we think every player is going to do. I'm trying to minimize that and not speculate on, where a guy's going to play, where he's going to be in a lineup. And, and I try to minimize that and not worry about it and react to it when it does happen. All right, Kevin, that's the whole episode today is speculating <laughs> on what's going to happen. So <laughs> got to you know, get through that. Now let's talk about some of that speculation, Kevin. We talked about prospects and not you're steering away from prospects in a draft and hold later on, but what, tell me then what has more value to you in a trade when a trade is actually announced the prospect that could be filling the role vacated by a trade or the bench player that's already on the major league roster that could gain some extra at-bats by filling in or option c the veteran free agent that's still available sure it's, right the, to- the, the yeah the matt Kemp of, of colorado we, and yeah <laughs> yeah and, and but i think and it 100 percent depends on what happens with this cb we're conditioned now have been for several years, let's say the length of Chris Bryant's career, we've been conditioned to think that we're not going to see prospects at the beginning of the season, at least for a couple of weeks. And then depending on how the team is performing, we may not see them for a little longer. And then the super two comes into play and then the team's still not performing well. So now we got to go through the whole thing again, the following season right? That's what just happened with Bobby Witt Jr. last season with the Royals. I, I still, there is no doubt in my mind if that Royals start when they started out 17 games into the season with the best record in baseball, if they hadn't went on a 13 game losing streak and they were still decent, we would have saw Bobby Witt Jr. with the Kansas City Royals last year. No, no doubt in my mind. There's just so many questions. And until we know how the new CBA is going to affect that, I think we're all conditioned to treat it like it has for the last few years. And in that case, in your scenario, then the prospect is the last of the the options for me. How about you, Matt? Like in, in these draft and holds, if you see, we talked about Bryson Stott and Jeremy Pena, like there's been announcement that they they have a path with the leaving of Correa, with the Phillies may not be happy with Didi Gregorius moving forward. Do you have, is there more value in taking a shot on those top end prospects who have been performing at the higher levels in the minors to take over that role or to take a shot on the, the guy that's already made it across the finish line and is in the majors already and could fill in that gap more often i'm gonna lean towards the, if there's a if there's a reason like a riley green it looks like he could crack the opening line lineup i'll take a shot because he's going late but like we're talking about oakland josh harrison he's a free agent he'll probably go back to oakland and all he's like multiple eligibility in a few spots he's he could bat third for this team if, if you're in middle oh corner infield we talked about how terrible it is who's probably going to get a job and maybe in oakland colin moran he's probably gonna play every day for a team like oakland he's going the term free everyone hates him he's going you're not being no one's competing with you for colin moran and <laughs> i could very well see them picking him up and playing him every day so yeah i'll take a i like to take my shot on there because i know he's going to get signed i know he's not going probably not going to the minors he plays well enough to fill in for one of these jobs that are open. So yeah, I, I prefer to go the boring route, which is no one likes, but hey, you know, I, the, I, the A's are going to do something like that. League minimum, Colin Moran, your opening day first baseman. And he gets traded yeah. on, you know, July 27th. <laughs> yeah, but I, I am also a hypocrite, Matt, because <laughs> the after <laughs> everything I just said, and I agree with everything you just said, I have Josh Young on several teams I've drafted. I think he's the starting third baseman for the Rangers 
if not opening day, two weeks in. So I have him on several teams. So I am a hypocrite as well. Well, I think that's a, that's a smart pick, right? Because the rumors are out there. They're trying to, they're trying to sign or trying to trade Kinda Isaiah Falefa. Kind of Falefa. Yeah. Young is just very good. And they signed Seager and, they and spend a lot those of those long-term yeah. deals. And by the end of those deals, they're going to be terrible. <laughs> so they actually need to get this thing going. So they can't afford to just wait. And I think that's just a, I think that's a better guess than some because he's going to be up. I'd be stunned if he's not. Or at least up early enough where he's actually profitable. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, we alluded to a lot of these. So let's get into some specifics. So I want to have some fun and talk some hypothetical situations based on rumors we may have heard over the course of the lockout or even prior to the lockout. Uh, A lot of people are waiting to see how many moves we'll make in that 48-hour window immediately after the lockout is lifted. And I'm going to assume we'll be expecting the same kind of floodgates to be opened as we saw leading up to the expiration of the CBA right before the lockout. So a lot could change as we talked about in a very short period of time. So I'm going to get some ground rules though for you guys. In these hypothetical trade scenarios, I want to put the caveat that the players being traded away are leaving an obvious hole for some sort in the package that the the team is getting would not fill that hole. So we're going to first one we're going to talk about is Oakland with the possibility of the both corner infield slots, Matt Chapman and Matt Olson leaving. That is to say that if Matt Olson is traded to the Yankees, aren't sending back Luke Voigt to fill in that first base one. Pretty clear. Um, and free agents are off the board. So the Josh Harrison thing you, <laughs> we mentioned earlier, not an option. So we're talking internal candidates only. Matt, I'm going to start with you. We're going to go start in Oakland. If both if you're either, kneecapping me by taking away external options. Yeah. <laughs> Make it as yeah interesting as possible. So Colin uh, Moran is not the answer. No, he's not the answer here. <laughs> but I'm glad you brought him up because that's obviously it is it's Oakland's MO. So if all of a sudden Billy Bean changes his mind, doesn't go that route, Matt Olson and or Matt Chapman are moved. Who fills in those? Who do you like to fill in those corner spots? And I think, and I'll also put the caveat, I think is really interesting the Matt Chapman aspect of this. Because he's going to be leaving a very large hole since his defense keeps him at third base all the time. I'm very interested to see who you come up with. All right. So the good news, Oakland fans, is if Matt Olson and Matt Chapman leave, you have no one in the minor leagues. Not a <laughs> single person that could be promoted. You got no one on your bench either. You have, there's no one that is going to fill in on their current team if those two players are traded that will be worthy of drafting in a fantasy league. <laughs> uh, but I think this does present, uh, this would obviously present a, a nice opportunity for the players like Seth Brown, who are likely looking at a platoon more often than not, where maybe they're not, there's not an option to take them out of the lineup. The, uh, maybe, because I love Seth Brown, I think that there's a, a prob- probability that uh, he has to be left in every single day. So I think that the, the big takeaway, if those two are traded and nothing external is brought in, is not necessarily their replacements, because I'm not even kidding. There is nothing for them in the minors that is coming, not even intriguing. They are a bad team about to break it down with no, with a very bad farm system. I don't know what they're thinking. Hopefully they get something in return. I mean, I think this is a situation where, yeah, they might not get anything to fill the holes immediately. They might be focusing 100% on prospects and the the future. Steven Piscotti, he's, he's had injuries and they're probably going to want to rest him. They may be forced to play him. So he's going super late. I love Tony Kemp. Again, he's going to be penciled in the middle infield, though. They're going to have to move people around. They'd be moving Pinder back to infield when Loriano comes back, that type of thing. Yeah, look at roster resource and look at those names minus the two and just think, (laughs) all right, this may not be the typical Oakland thing where they're moving people around. A lot of these guys are going to have to play and move. Yeah. Like you said, Chad Pinder, a lot of people like him late. I like, like I said, Seth Brown, maybe they can't platoon him. So I think that's really the biggest takeaway because it's everyone give the names here. They don't really have any obvious first or third baseman currently on the roster. And in the minor leagues right now, they have uh, Jonah Bride and Jeremy uh, Ironman. Nothing. It's not, it's not happening. Yeah. It's going to get ugly. I'd wonder if, if they could move Sean Murphy over 
over to first base in that scenario just to keep him off his knees for an extended period of time. Similarly to, you know, how, you know, San Francisco put Posey over at first base for a while as well. So I, that caught my eye to get that extra, those extra plate appearances possibly in that scenario. Pinder is the one that stood out to me the most in, in Oakland because he had the versatility of playing a bunch of different positions over the course of the last three or four years. And of course, he was just that fantasy darling leading up, I think, into the 2019 season. It did not happen, but he was that stat cast darling going into that and only ended up with 13 home runs, the same as he had the year prior with only 370 plate appearances. So if he were to get an opportunity to get closer to the 450, 500 plate appearances, which to your point, I think if they don't fill any either of these roles with a major league free agent or somebody coming in if they eat somebody's contract for a year or something like that there are players that have might have the opportunity of gaining those extra plate appearances on this roster which is by the way that's uh why i'm not trying to sell anyone again i'm gonna bring up his name it's gonna it's gonna sound like i'm his agent colin moran <laughs> i said you gotta if you're taking shots on plate in drafting cha- draft champions if you're taking shot late on offense you gotta come up with a reason why a player will play and you're looking at the A's and if they're going to do what they claim they're going to do and everyone thinks they're going to do, they're going to be desperate, like desperate. And he just makes a lot of sense. So that's why I bring him up as a target because again, Max Muncy, but uh, yeah, it's a terrible, it's a Scott Hatterberg situation. Otherwise where they're just going to be handing out gloves to random people here, go try. <laughs> it, it's yeah. Pick a fan night in uh, every Thursday, <laughs> pick a fan night. You win a raffle. You get to play second base today. Congratulations. Yeah, I'm going to, this is going a little off script here, but I'm curious to know what you guys thought. Does either one of you guys know when, like when the KBO or MPB stop signing free agents? Because as we start seeing the Gregory Polancos of the world and the DJ Stewart's go over, you stop, you stop seeing that re- as of recently. I, I guess I bring that up because I worried about, I haven't drafted Moran just because I was actually worried he was going to be that type of player that just, you know what, I'm not waiting around for the lockout to end. I'm not going to get a big contract anyway. Let's just go get some guaranteed money overseas. Is that, should that fear be over at this point? Um, in, in, or is that still something that lingers? Kevin, do you have any thoughts on that? I don't know when their signing deadline is. And I, I tried to do a quick search and it's showing everything that comes up as posting deadlines for MLB, sure. which makes sense. Cause that's what we would typically be searching for. But yeah, we've seen that with a few guys like Gregory Polanco and those fringe guys that, oh, we don't know when this lockout's going to end. Maybe I should just get my money and go play baseball. I don't know if it's going to happen. So I understand your question 100% and it makes a lot of sense, but I don't know how long they have to decide to make their way across the Pacific. Matt, is that a concern of yours when you're looking at players like Moran or or guys that are fringe major leaguers that have not signed yet? No, only because it depends on somebody. Some players are just not going to want to go. They just want to stay home. There's And the, the players that do sign, it comes at random. I don't think anyone thought Gregory Polanco was going over there. So he can hit anyone at any age. So it's just hard. You can't start fading people because of it. So overall... And this is coming with someone who, who drafted Masahiro Tanaka last year in early drafts. And that was with rumors that he was considering going over because I saw publicly what the offers were, especially from the Yankees, that they were offering him. He's not going back there. He's <laughs> going to stay with the Yankees for whatever the $20 million they're They were offering him like $20 million. I'm like, of course he's coming back. I'm getting at the end of drafts. I'm like, this is free money. He goes to the KB. I'm like, okay. Yeah, but yeah, if there's no rumors of any kind, it's hard to it's hard to be scared of it. But I, what you said makes sense. It's just, it just depends on so many things that I just can't be. If it it's bites, just, it's, like, it's just one more thing to worry about, especially in rounds forty-five. I wasn't worried. 50. Now I am. Damn. Thank you. <laughs> All right, let's hit up a, a pitching scenario, Kevin, in Cincinnati. Very similarly to Oakland, there's all these rumors that they're going to break it all down, especially the pitching staff. So I'm going to ask you if any combination of Sonny Gray, Luis Castillo, and or Tyler Molle are traded, who are you targeting or who should be people be targeting to fill the rotation? For the- I'm not so sure the Reds are breaking everything down. We heard this last season as well. And yeah, they let Trevor Bauer walk and they, they did trade Iglesias. But other than that, none of the rest of the things came to fruition. And they have a 
decent lineup. They're rolling out Jonathan India, Winker, Vado, Suarez was back to his old self in September. Tyler Stevenson, everyday catcher now. We talked about Moustakis, if he can be a full-time DH. They have a pretty nice lineup. Why would they do this? But to answer your question, if they do, there, there's an obvious two names, and it's the two names everybody wants to get excited about. It, it, it's Hunter He's Green. He's already gone. Too late. <laughs> <laughs> it's Hunter Green and, and Nick Lodolo, right? That's the two guys people want to hear about. Hey, not and everybody. At least with Hunter Green, we have been told he does get to compete for a spot in, in the starting rotation. It's probably less likely with Lodolo still probably another season away, but it's possible. And if my intuition is right and they don't break it down and, and we know five starters isn't enough, you end up needing six, seven, eight throughout a season. Then it becomes more likely that they use both of these guys throughout the season. But uh, yeah, Hunter, Hunter Green is being drafted as if he has a legitimate shot to make this rotation. And Lodolo has been, pe- been picked late in the draft and holds as well. So that's the two names people want to hear. It's really, as far as I see, it's all they got. TJ Antone isn't going to be back for a while. His TJ surgery just happened in August. So he's not going to be back for a while. So they really don't have anybody else other than their two top prospects coming up. Yeah, I do. And I'm, while you were talking, I did another my own little search. And I, I thought I remember reading Reavers and Martin would be in the mix as well with those two guys to compete for. I was counting him as in the rotation now already. Okay. All right. (laughs) So that's why I didn't bring his name up. That would give him more uh, of a guaranteed spot, at least something that was a little bit more solidified, even if he were to stumble out of the gate in spring training, if that obvious opening is still there, he's going quite late past pick 400 in DC is not being picked at all. Obviously in, I shouldn't, be, I shouldn't say obviously, but at least hasn't been picked in any of the last six online championships, reverse San Martin. That is who did make a couple starts at the end of last year. Names at least keep on your board to go along with the other top prospects that Kevin was mentioning. So speaking of Wade Miley, <laughs> Matt, we'll go over to the Cubs where Wade Miley already is playing. Not specifically about Miley, though. I think the rumor, the major rumor that revolved around the Cubs has been Wilson Contreras being traded out of the catcher spot. So if he actually is, and I, this is my hypothetical, but I, I will be hypocritical as well and say, I actually don't see this happening. The more and more I, I think about it and the more and more I see what the Cubs have are doing as questionable, I think. As if some they of the hadn't moves signed are. Marcus Stroman. Stroman, that's the big one. Yeah, yeah, that's the big one for sure. <laughs> but there's also a rumor now that they, again, rumor that two months later, apparently, <laughs> that they're looking into Anthony Rizzo. So. Uh, yeah, the Cubs. Yeah, it seems like they're going for, I don't know what they're doing, like a reverse Reds here. <laughs> I'm going back to the Reds for a second. Yeah, if they didn't, if they didn't get rid of, uh, if they didn't get rid of Iglesias last year, they could have really went for it if they didn't like semi give up. <laughs> and then this year they shouldn't. And then they gave away Miley for free. And obviously he pitched a little bit over his head, but look at the rotation we were talking about. They shouldn't be trading. They should be adding. It's insane. But uh, yeah, I don't think you actually got to the question yet. So yeah. If Contreras is moved away from the Cubs, who gets the plate appearances at catcher and the possible, I think a lot of people are assuming Contreras is going to get a good chunk of the DH spots in the National League. One of the one of the few catchers, in my opinion, that is almost guaranteed. He, he did see a lot of those DH spots in 2020 when they had it. Who gets the who gets those plate appearances at those two positions? One, I do agree with you. I don't think he's going anywhere. And I love him a lot in Chicago because they don't have a really good DH. It's one of the few teams where he is. Like, he could be moved to a team where he doesn't have the DH at bats because they could just have a much better hitter. Here, he's, guar- he's guaranteed to... Not guaranteed. He's more likely to get him. Jan Gomes is the uh, the obvious. He's currently the backup. He'll move into the starting catcher role. The ma- He'll start the vast majority of the games. There's They're unlikely to acquire someone or uh, sign someone that's going to really hinder him much. So that's big. The DH thing is interesting. Right now they have Clint Frazier in there. We don't know what to expect of him. Who knows? Like with Vertigo and his kind of like general attitude, who, who knows what to expect from him? The guy I would be very interested in, I'm interested now, is Harold Ramirez. Love the guy. I don't even think he's going to platoon as roster resource has him right now. He just had a, he had a really good first half with Cleveland. And in the second half, he dealt with quite a bit of injuries. In the first half, 280, he, he hit 
six home runs and he stole a couple of bags early in his minor league career. He actually stole a lot of bases, but in, in recent years, he hasn't, but I don't know if it's by design or not. He has 88th percentile sprint speed. So he actually has some high BABIP skills and he sprays the ball all around the park. If you look at his spray charts, like laser beam down the middle for singles, he likes just taking what the defense gives him and he spreads his power all over the field from the right side. He's also 94th percentile exit velocity. There's like a lot of skill here. And if he's going to move from uh, Cleveland to Chicago, a pretty nice park, I could see him getting everyday bats if he's as good as I hope. Again, this is something where... There's a lot of moving pieces. We don't know if Chicago is going to continue to add. He easily could. But uh, Harold Ramirez is someone that uh, is going pretty late right now that I could see him like really uh, breaking out if they give him an everyday opportunity. And he should be able to earn one, especially if Contreras were to move. They'd want to get as many good bats in there as possible. Uh, so yeah, with or without Contreras, I like Ramirez as a target. But in, in 12 team fab, it's probably not a, the greatest idea. It's one of those things where maybe... You know, depending on how your draft goes, maybe he's a guy you draft last. Watch spring training, see how it shakes out, dump him if it doesn't work, pick him up if he does. But he'll be someone that I think he'll his value could skyrocket if he finds himself some everyday at bats. Yeah, we were talking about Harold Ramirez a lot, in, really about mid or early mid season last year, and as we're recommending different fab targets to go after, and I was also surprised that he wasn't running a little bit more in Cleveland. To the point you said, Matt, like he obviously had the history longer, you know, earlier on and he has the speed and Cleveland likes to run like Cleveland's typically in the top third uh, of teams that are, are taking advantage of the opportunities that are given to them on the base pass. I was a little disappointed there. I will like to see how the Cubs utilize that aspect of his game and the, the Cubs weren't shy. Um, about running as well they weren't quite as high as Cleveland was most of the season but you use what you're given and if you have certain talents that outweigh all the rest of the talents and I'm looking at you and looking at that Cubs roster running might become more of a, a central focus um, of that team yeah, one and thing he, it's like he, you, can't, you can't draft him with the expectation of getting speed but it's you look at his profile and his background and everyone jokes and I think everyone I think knows the finding the next Cedric Mullins exercise, finding the next Robert Ray. It's a worthless exercise because no one saw it coming. Even the people who believe, Justin Mason, uh, if anyone who knows he is, he loves Cedric Mullins. He didn't see this. The whole idea is you love the skills and you thought of given everyday playing time, you could see the path. Tyrone Taylor, I could see the path. Harold Ramirez, I could see the path. Am I projecting them to become a superstar? No, but if next year we're talking about who's this year's Tyrone Taylor, Harold Ramirez, because they just did it, I wouldn't be shocked because I, you can see it. You're going to go back and be like, all right, we can see how it could have happened. You can't draft, obviously, with the expectation of that, but it's the kind of thing you look for. It, the problem with these picks is their floor is worthless. That's their floor is a trap door. But yeah, that's you got to take shots like that sometimes. And we can see the tweak that needs to be made, too, with Harold Ramirez. He hits the ball really hard. The Christian Yelich's last season in Miami, him and Eric Hosmer were almost the same hitter. One of them started lifting the ball a little bit. The other one didn't, right? Harold Ramirez has that capability. I'm not saying he's the next Christian Yelich. I'm saying there is a pathway to him becoming a very productive major league player. Yeah, it's hard to hear that too because it's, he comes from Cleveland. He has that has that ability and he has that profile. And then I'm also reminded of Yandy Diaz. Same exact right. situation from Cleveland. Can't hit the ball in the air. Go somewhere. That's all everybody was talking about. Tampa can just make them hit it in the air. I did remember reading a, a small little snippet saying that the Cubs have a specific program kind of focused on getting people to hit it in the air. It, I think that's just a hitting coach, though. I think that's just something every team probably needs to have at some at this point in the game. But all right, let's move out east. As Matt has alluded to a few times throughout the pod, let's talk about the Mets and. Matt, let's just get right to it. Who benefits the most if any of those guys you talked about earlier, Jeff McNeil, Dominic Smith, or J.D. Davis, or any combination gets traded off the Mets roster? I'll try to be shorter. This is too complicated. This is too complicated. There's too many players. Um, I understand. Here's the thing. is a, Whoever gets traded could benefit a bunch of others, and you have to add Robinson Cano into this as well because they could just decide in spring training if he doesn't stack up, they could just release him. Or he just ends up being the everyday DH. His ceiling and floor are very far apart as well. If Jeff McNeil gets traded entirely, 
I would say that would end up benefiting J.D. Davis the most. But this is us not planning on them signing like a Chris Bryant either. Because I think without Jeff McNeil at third, Eduardo Escobar would have to move there. But I don't think they want Cano at second. They would want him at DH. Therefore, I think McNeil would go to second, leaving third base open. Dom Smith ain't playing there. So if we're counting on external options not having, if Jeff McNeil moves, J.D. Davis gets gets the boost. If J.D. Davis alone gets traded, I don't think that benefits anybody. And if Dominic Smith gets traded, I don't think that benefits anyone either, individually. I think there's a chance that uh, two of these three definitely go. I can see um, a lot of different things uh, moving out. But I think that... Jeff McNeil can Jeff McNeil and JD Davis can have value not being traded. Dominic Smith, I don't see it. So he's my least favorite target this year, but the Mets need a starting pitching badly because of the the question marks they have. Oakland, if they're going to be sh- chopping everything down, like we said, they don't need they desperately need a first baseman. Dominic Smith should be a prime target for them. And that would be obviously not a great park, but a good spot for him. So there's too many variables here, (laughs) but I would say that out of everything, because I said Cano, Davis, Smith, McNeil, there's so many things. If the Mets are going to add anyone else, Eduardo Escobar, where is he going to play? I would say Jeff McNeil and JD Davis would be the ones that would benefit the most if there's any trades, because yeah, if McNeil moves, JD Davis is going to be playing. But again, then you got Brett Beatty. (laughs) You got, you got a couple of guys in the minor leagues that can come up and make some noise and they'll be coming up eventually, probably really quickly to replace him as well. So (laughs) in general, it's just like, you can't plan for it. You don't go overboard on your shares of any of these guys, no matter how cheap they are. Yeah. All right. We'll stay in the East and Kevin and go to Pittsburgh and more of the more recent quote rumors that I noticed was that there's a strong, there's at least a possibility, if not a strong possibility, that Pittsburgh will be shopping Kevin Newman once the lockout ends. And my question about that is that what does the Pirates opening day infield look like? And do you care? <laughs> I'm going to answer the second part of that question first. <laughs> and no, I, I really don't care. I, I, I don't mind players on bad teams. In fact, players on bad teams can be awesome for fantasy teams, but they need to be closer to the top of the lineup. I love Tutugo in this Pittsburgh lineup. If he's going to play every day, doing what he did once he got everyday playing time when he made the move over to them last season. But I think the move here would be Michael Chavis is now the second baseman, not our designated hitter, the way they have him penciled in on roster resource right now. And He's still hitting at the bottom of the lineup and a poor average. And who does that make room for at DH? Like nobody I really care about. So yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head. I really don't care. Of course I would keep an eye on it and and make sure whoever is going to get an opportunity. If if it's going to be closer to the top of the lineup, then I'll become interested. But I think that's pretty set right now with Hayes, Sutsugo, Reynolds up there at the top. They already have O'Neill Cruz penciled in as a starter. Once again, that's a question mark. But so that that's just another reason that unless you're in the top third or so of this lineup, then I'm not really interested. Yeah, I think we mentioned him again when we had Jeff Zimmerman and Tanner Bell on is Tukapita Marcano, who made it his debut at the end of last year as well, with the possibility of filling in at second base. I just be I'd be more excited about O'Neill Cruz right now. I don't. Everyone loves him so much, but I just think that there's I don't think there's very little chance he actually is on the opening day roster as much as anyone's hoping for because they're going to finish last with or without him. And he's being drafted off based on one batted ball event. He had the max that one yeah, yeah. 119. <laughs> yeah. He's a massive guy, seven feet tall. He's, he's gonna, They're going to take advantage of him. He's probably going to struggle a lot. So there's a lot of swing and miss there, and he's probably going to struggle. But again, if people are taking Jazz Chisholm in the top 100, certainly take a shot on O'Neill Cruz if he's going to be in there. So yeah, if they traded, but if they traded Newman, I'd feel better about it. <laughs> so that would be the only player that I think I would feel that would benefit the most is a Cruz actually making the team if Newham is traded because uh, then there's more of a need for him. I don't think because Cole Tucker is not very good. Yeah, I, I I think that they'll I think they will start the season with Cole Tucker as the as a starting shortstop if he's not moved as well. But there's no no rumor that I could see with him on the trading block. But there was also that talk that O'Neill Cruz was going to take some you know reps in the outfield as well with the possibility of moving out there at least part time. So I think people are drafting him with the expectation that Pittsburgh really wants him up. He obviously made his debut already, so they'll have to hold him down a little bit longer um, than the normal three weeks to get that extra year of playing time, which 
I'm not, you know, saying that they're not going to do that. But if I would like to remind people, he only had 29 plate appearances in AAA. <laughs> they brought him up as a pat on the back, and he had a 44% strikeout rate. He's being drafted based on one batted <laughs> ball event. Do not draft him. I guarantee you, he's not in the opening day lineup. There's unless we'll see what happens with the CBA. All uh, right, because that, right. that really affects a lot of this. But if it's anywhere close to now. I just see no purpose. They're going to start his clock. He's going to strike out 75 times in a row. They're going to send him back. It's just like, it's rough. It's, it would be a, it would be, it would be unlikely that he would start the season as their shortstop and not struggle badly. I think. Yeah. It, it, if the CBA changes drastically, my, the answer I would love to give here is Nick Gonzalez is going to be playing second base for the <laughs> pirates, but he hasn't played Probably above high A. All, to be right? yeah. He is, he could be their best hitter right now, but he hasn't played above high A. He slugged five sixty five at high A last season. And, and I don't see anybody else in the pirates lineup doing that. Maybe Satsugo if he gets to play every day, but, and he could do it at, against high A pitching, but yeah, and that's the guy I'd love to see. And he is 23 years old. He, he's not like he's 18 or 19 year old, but it would take drastic changes to the CBA for us to see. Well, there was that thing that the MLB wanted to give teams like bonus first round picks for bringing up just YOLO pirates, yeah. bring up yeah, everybody, bring, bring up Swaggerty, bring up Marcano, bring up everyone. <laughs> Get those draft picks. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Cruz going at two twenty four currently in the last three weeks of draft champion. So mid 15th round, this is not a prospect that people are drafting because of the price they are drafting him, as said, based on that one batted ball event. Hey, and, by the way, and I don't want to hate now. I love O'Neill Cruz. <laughs> I, I live in South Jersey. I will be driving to PNC, most beautiful ballpark in the entire league, to watch him. He is awesome. But yeah, he's going to struggle. So well, I don't, don't give me, save your hate mail. I like O'Neill. I will hope that he starts in AAA because I'm based in Indianapolis, so I can go catch him before he moves back up to Pittsburgh as the uh, Pirates have their AAA team. Here hey, if there's Indiana. still a lockout, minor league season starts on time. He's, but he's probably play. he's on the 40 man, so he won't get a play. All right. And then, Matt, we're going to stay in the East, NL East for this last one. And this is less of um, a guy who could get traded in more of somebody who might not get re-signed. And that is, of course, uh, Freddie Freeman in Atlanta. So if Atlanta doesn't actually bring back their cornerstone of their franchise, Freddie Freeman, and they don't sign another first first baseman, which I be, a lot of people assume they would do if Colin they don't Moran. resign him. <laughs> Colin Moran is not the answer to this <laughs> question. Who plays first base? And I, I'm going to say that you can't use roster. Roster Resource has Orlando Arcia as the starting first baseman in Atlanta right now. Hey, don't get me wrong. I've got a lot of shares of Orlando Arcia in the late, in my late DCs, but I have no expectation that he is the starting first baseman who, if anybody is playing first base, maybe they have a ghost position player there. Nobody plays first base. I'm not sure, but who do you like? Honestly, the best guy to move there if they sign someone currently is Travis Darno. He would probably it would probably save him a little bit from his injuries, and he has some experience there, not not much, but he would be the guy to uh, to move over there, bring up William Contreras from AAA. And uh, is that part of why him. they signed Manny Pena? Right? Is is yeah. that what they're thinking already? So I yeah I think that would be the yeah that would be the move. I, I don't really see another one, but that's not a bad one. I like he was just saying. I I think that Kevin was saying that. I think Darno is something they're already if they don't sign Kyle Moran. <laughs> <laughs> we got almost all Mets fans so I see these rumors of Matt Olson I'm like don't do that let Freeman walk let Olson go to the Yankees you guys sign Moran it'll be fine you don't need any more players yeah the, only, the thing I see in Atlanta is just they have a plethora they still have a plethora of outfielders even with the drama that is happening there with between injuries and legal troubles and what have you I wonder if they move somebody who has less than ideal less than ideal defensive capabilities to that corner spot at first base and whether that's drew waters being called up and i know he he has played center field in the past but uh, he's not going to be a center fielder moving forward obviously pache is not an answer to play first base he's he, he actually his only redeeming quality at this point is his defense in center field but i'd be curious to see if they end up moving that route or Austin Riley moves over to first base and and they fill the third base third base hole in, in that direction as well. Those would be some directions that I'd be looking at in, in that scenario. Kevin, everyone brings up the popular rumor is Olsen because they talked to Olsen. Apparently that's the rumor, but they don't they have to give up so much. And I don't, that's not really the brave style to give up a ton. They'll make big moves, but it's usually 
out of other teams' desperation. They usually get them on the cheap. They don't like to spend money. Look at Acuna's uh, a contract. Look at Albies. They don't spend a ton of money either. And I don't think they would settle for a bargain basement person. They're the defending World Series champion. So I'm obviously just joking about Moran. Anthony Rizzo looks like a perfect place for them. The, he's going to get way less money than he probably is worth. And he's a solid first baseman. He just seems like such a brave signing to me. So if Freeman leaves, I feel like that's like the landing spot. I like that. That just seems like to such the, it'll be this really undervalued deal. And everyone's gonna be like, Oh my God, how did the Braves get him for whatever it ends up being? <laughs> and it just, but uh, yeah. And I think this is one of the most likely, if not the most likely of the scenarios you brought up, Adam, the Braves, I don't think have any problem giving Freddie Freeman what he is worth on an average per season basis. But unlike teams like the Yankees or Dodgers, that'll give him a couple extra years and say, we'll just worry about that money later. I don't think the Braves are going to do that. I, I see this being a Albert Pujols leaving St. Louis situation where they, they were very steady. They knew what he was worth, but we're, we're not giving you those years. I, I see that happening here and they will have to make one of these decisions. Kevin and, and Adam, what do you think of this though, too? Because besides the pool hole thing you brought up, they would have a problem, a clubhouse problem, because if you're handing out, especially the years he's going to want, and they're not giving him any kind of a hometown discount, at least in terms of even years. They should have locked him up already, by the way, Braves. This right. is a headache your fans <laughs> and you do not need. You should have done this already. If they sign him to that, they have an Albies and Acuna problem. You can't right. have Freeman making that much money and those other two making nothing. It's How can they not be upset? They have to be. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I think most people would end up agreeing to that sentiment. It's hard to justify it. I don't want to sit here and try to play devil's advocate here, but it's really it's not worth it at all. It would be not only I don't know, maybe as they they're in trouble if they do, they're in trouble if they don't type of situation where they don't sign them and then everybody says you can't you, I can't believe you brought back. You didn't bring back the cornerstone of the franchise. You know, they, he has an Atlanta jersey on his entire career. Why didn't you bring him back? You should have done whatever you could to. What do you, to, what do you think he's asking for? I, I bet they could have signed him to five or six at thirty, and I bet I, they wish at the end. I, of the I think year that was the rumors they, they, they offered. The thing is, they're, he's want years, like five. yeah. And so that that would be their their PR move, right? Is yeah. hopefully somebody signs him to eight, so then they can point at Albert Pujols and say, "This is why we don't have Freddie Freeman." <laughs> for eight years it's, it's, <laughs> if somebody signs him for six though then they're, they're gonna have a headache on it i'll like to stand on all right that's enough hypotheticals for the for one episode kevin i'm gonna let you sign us off with any other words of wisdom you might have for those that are still they're still drafting or maybe even getting into just starting to get into drafts no we've had so many great guests over the last few weeks like uh, Matt, of course, and, and we've been talking more strategy than specific players over the last few weeks anyway. Just a, a bit of a s- synopsis that all the little things add up to a big thing. Like, league format, the, when you're doing your checking ADP, make sure you're filtering that. Recent dates, the specific leagues that are most similar to, to what you're drafting for and, and just go through all of the little steps, they all add up to a big thing. I say that a lot throughout the season, saying it again now in the preseason as we're, this is the first time, the last day and a half is the first time since December I haven't been actively drafting and I'll be kicking it off again here within a day or two, I'm sure. But it's so much going on and the shift from a lot of draft and hold leagues to fab leagues, that makes a big difference. We've talked about a lot of those differences. Just make sure you're paying attention to it all. Take some notes, go over them before each draft. And ever if it's a slow draft, every couple of days, go over them again. Make sure you're not forgetting things. Yeah, I think that's, uh, of course, that's great advice. Matt, a follow-up to that point that Kevin was making about taking notes throughout. You said you've been drafting since October. Like, have you, without going back and looking at an actual draft results, do you feel like you've adjusted your strategy from start to finish, not based on what the market's doing per se, but like just how you are drafting from the time you were drafting in October, November versus if you were to start a draft. Yeah, the it does have to do with what the market's doing. I'm not necessarily speaking to like the, I know you said that to leave that out, but more what the player pool is now. You get an idea of, of as the ADP shifting and starting to settle a little more where you can wait, where, where you need to jump, where the pockets of value in certain parts of the draft, 
or you know where you want to be. So yeah, I think you shift based on that. But overall, is it, ignore ADP, especially now. It's not settled, especially now. Everyone has, there's so much information out there. Everyone's recommended the same sleepers. Use ADP to get an idea of where other people may be going. But overall, you just don't care. <laughs> this is more of advice for everyone. Don't care what anyone thinks about your pick. If you do not think a player is going to make it back to you and you really need that player on your team or want that player on your team, draft them. It does not matter. So uh, everyone, I always see this thing like, oh, can you believe that guy dropped? And who cares? You don't have to draft a player because they dropped 30 picks past their max if they you don't want them. If you want a player 30 picks beforehand because you get a sneaking suspicion that someone else may take them, you, you grab them. But yeah, overall, the uh, I haven't I don't change too much. Yeah, I, I like to draft early to get an idea of the player pool. I actually looked at a draft. I did a way too early mock in like beginning of October, and my team was like not that far off of current ADP. Actually, let me. I have it. I actually had it in front of me. I was looking at it not too long ago. So I'll bring it up real quick. I was drafting in, I think I was drafting in the last spot and I'll just tell you guys so you can see what this looked like. Yeah, I was drafting in the last spot. I ended up with uh, Ronald. This is in order. Brandon Woodruff in the second. Robbie Ray, Francisco Lindor, Brandon Lau, Frankie Montas, Austin Riley, Charlie Morton, Tommy Edmond. Other than Riley going late, actually. The, yeah, that's pretty, right about where you could get right now. Yeah, yeah it's... Yeah. Other than that, you do have to adjust to the market, but you know, I just rambled a whole bunch of things off there. So hopefully some of that was useful to the audience. I think the, <laughs> the key takeaway was ignore ADP. <laughs> yeah, Some- no, seriously. People get so hung up on it. People oh, feel yeah. like, especially social media, if, if people are involved in that, which is people feel like embarrassed. Like they, they feel the need to like, oh, can you believe how late I took this guy? I'm like, yeah, the rest of the league's not impressed because no one else. <laughs> Who are you trying to impress? Take someone that's going to help your team. All right, Matt, thanks so much for taking the time to, you know, break all of these hypotheticals down with us and give some really solid advice in general to all our listeners. Uh, could you remind our listeners where they can follow you, any specific uh, things that you might be working on as draft season is rolling along um, and what they should be keeping a lookout for? Sure. Uh, everyone, you can follow me on Twitter at, at Matt Williams, M-E-T-T-W-I-7-7-I-M-S. 7, 7, My DMs are always open. I love talking baseball. If you have any questions, you don't want to see your league mates to see if you're a lot of people, again, some people feel embarrassed asking questions in public because they think they'll think oh, there's no stupid questions. Go ahead and ask me. I'll explain anything you want. There's a lot of cool data out there. I'm happy to talk you through it. NBC Sports Edge, you can catch me there during the regular season. My by the numbers columns coming back every single Tuesday and subscribe to the Turn 2 podcast every single week with uh, Brian Seymour. That's awesome. Yeah, absolutely. You guys should be doing that. Follow all that stuff on the Twitter and make sure you subscribe uh, to Turn 2 podcast as well. So Matt, thanks again so much for joining us here. That's going to wrap us up for episode 46 of On The Wire. Please make sure to subscribe, share and review the podcast wherever you're listening, even if your review is a general tweet out there and not on a specific platform. It goes a long way to let us know what you think and show others what you think as well. Hopefully it's a positive note. Make sure you're listening to all the other great podcasts on the Pitcher List Podcast Network by following at Pitcher List Pods on Twitter for updates and subscribing to both the Pitcher List Fantasy Baseball Podcast feed and the new Pitcher List General Baseball Podcast feed, as well for all of our non fantasy baseball podcasts. You can follow myself on the Twitter at 80 Grade. It's all spelled out. Kevin is at Hasting Kevin. And once again, our guest Matt Williams is at Matt Williams with the L's replaced with sevens. And his podcast, of course, you should be listening to is a turn to podcast. Thanks once again, Matt, for joining us. And on behalf of Kevin Hasting, I am Adam Howe. And with that, we bid you goodbye. Goodbye.